Richard. Um, welcome to Bayesian Statistics, Statistical Rethinking. So the next 10 weeks approximately, I think that's what it'll take us, but I'm willing to slow down if necessary. Um, we'll go through the entire book, which is an introduction to applied Bayesian statistics. Uh, the hope this week is to do chapters 1, 2, and 3, and that sounds ambitious, but I don't think it is because chapters 1, 2, and 3 are mostly words, very light on code and, and mathematics. Uh, they're conceptual delivery, foundation building. Um, so we'll do two lectures each week, an hour each, uh, so the lectures will not be exhaustive of the book content, um, but I'll hit the conceptually most difficult points and do an example of each of the, of the applied tasks that we're interested in learning as we go through. Um, you're welcome to interrupt me with questions, uh, and um, the microphone might pick up your questions, but I'll recite them in some hopefully correct interpretation uh, for the microphone anyway, and then that'll be an opportunity to tell me whether I've understood your question as well. But questions are great. People get a lot from them, so please don't be shy about it. Okay, so with that, I'll get started. Uh, first chapter um, is, is not about statistics itself, but more about philosophy of science. So, uh, uh, oh, that's the, the course outline I should have told you before, uh, about philosophy of science. So let me, let me take a step back and, and forget about statistics, if you will, for a second, if you can. Uh, I think like most of you, I got into this line of work not to do statistics. Uh, there's nothing about statistics that I enjoy. It's just something I have to do to get to work, right? Uh, like lots of things. Like I don't like riding the bus, but if I want to get to work, sometimes I have to ride the bus. And statistics is like a bus. Uh, you need to ride it to get from data to inference. Uh, there's no leaving it aside. There's no way to do uh, to process quantitative data without some sort of statistical framework. Um, and probably like most of you, uh, you know, I've been, I've been, I was inspired by natural phenomena. Uh, I'm an evolutionary scientist, so the range of questions that interest me could be summarized perhaps as, uh, where does nature come from and why does it take the form it does, uh, the natural world? And in particular, I'm interested in human evolution, but I, I mean, I'm also interested in things like uh, the origins of species, the diversity of birds in, in Pacific Islands and all sorts of things like that, uh, all the sorts of questions in evolutionary ecology. Um, but even if you're not an evolutionary ecologist, you're a social scientist, uh, there is a similar range of questions. Um, why do human societies take the forms they do? What are their histories and dynamics? And what are the consequences of modifications in the environment? Uh, these are rice fields in contemporary China, uh, shot from above. I think this is a fantastic photo, right? With the sky reflecting off of them. Uh, this sort of terraforming is a hallmark of our species, uh, like you know, the building we're in is a form of terraforming, right? And, uh, these are natural processes uh, that we also study, and these are the phenomena that interest us. And scientific theories um, take the forms of collections of models that help us uh, explain and predict phenomena of various kinds. Uh, so we come to these subjects with an interest in developing theories, and some of those theories um, are instantiated in mathematical forms, some of them aren't. Uh, and then we get evidence that we're using to threaten uh, these theories, and that's where the statistical um, uh, pain arises, the, that you can't dodge it. Uh, and the awkwardness of, um, well really, late 20th century statistics, and now what the statistics profession is trying to address in the early 21st century, is that introductory statistics focuses on a very narrow range of statistical tools which are really not up to the job of doing cutting edge scientific. Uh, and uh, most of those tools revolve around the analysis of agricultural experiments. So, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher um, was a giant in evolutionary theory, but also a giant in statistics. Often those two communities aren't aware <laughs> of one another uh, in those terms. Um, and his, his uh, statistical work mainly did not focus on population genetics, but on the analysis of agricultural trials at Rothamsted Agricultural Station, which is still going strong, by the way. The, the photo on the right is... Um, a uh, fairly recent photo, aerial photo of Rothamsted uh, experimental field. On the left is a stained glass window um, that commemorates Ari Fisher's contributions. Uh, and uh, the, the color pattern is the, uh, one of, supposed to represent one of his randomization schemes for plots. 
Uh, that's one of the things he's famous <laughs> for. Fisher's contributions to the analysis of agricultural experiments are, are fantastic. I'm not trying to, to malign them. They're great. So this is where analysis of variance that most of you, the psychologists in the room will know this, right? You, the deep tunnel, you think about ANOVA, you black out, <laughs> right? <laughs> When you wake up, there's some sums of squares on your page or something, right? <laughs> and uh, so ANOVA is a workhorse of analyzing factorial experiments, and it's great. Um, and there are other procedures that Fisher and his contemporaries developed, which you can think of as, they're often taught as tests, they're little procedures. Uh, in some stats uh, uh, software, they're actually called procedures, right? Like in SAS. Uh, these, these procedures can do specific things, but the problem is that when you're learning these procedures, you're not simultaneously learning a framework to develop, well, to connect any arbitrary theory or model to evidence. And so what you end up with, uh, what many of us end up with is, well, flowcharts like this. So you get a data set, you've got some set of questions, and then the um, uh, suggestion is, well, literally a flowchart like this. I drew this, but I drew it from somebody else's. Uh, so this is an actual flowchart. I, I have only just redrawn it to protect the innocent. And uh, the idea is, well, it's it's the way you in, interrogate the data has only to do with uh, a few small things which are features of the data itself and not the theory. Uh, this is terrifyingly bad. This is an awful thing. I'm going to assert and hopefully convince you over the next 10 weeks that we can do a lot better. And the statistics profession is, is of course, in, in unison about that. Um, these tools, like one-way ANOVA and chi-square tests and so on, they have their place, absolutely. But uh, learning these procedures and having flowcharts to choose among them is not a robust way to interrogate theories with data. Um, the biggest problem, if I can focus in on the thing that will consume us today, is um, that all of these procedures are taught in a way that they're focused on testing null hypotheses. The goal of all these procedures is to reject some null hypothesis of no effect, typically no effect. Uh, that gets that gets rather subtle when you have matrix data, what no effect means, but still, whatever the analogy might be to that in a matrix. Um, so to try and explain to you uh, a little bit of what I mean, I'm, let's think metaphorically about these things. There are really lots of metaphors in the course, and I hope that's okay with you guys. <laughs> uh, so um, I want you to think about statistical models as robots of a certain kind, uh, but the, the the problem with the word robot is people think of robots as being precise. Uh, those of you who work with robots in labs may have different impressions of them. <laughs> but uh, pipetting robots, right, they sometimes go wild. But uh, so I want to use a slightly different metaphor, a golem. Uh, so we, we live relatively uh, close to Prague here in Leipzig. Uh, so the, the local audience may be familiar with this. Um, so golem, this is a legendary robot. Uh, the thing it is, the first robot of folklore. And uh, the golem is, uh, comes from Jewish legend, uh, from the Kabbalah. Uh, the clay figure animated to life um, with Kabbalah magic. Uh, and it really is just an automaton. It's constructed. It doesn't have uh, consciousness or will of its own, but it carries out orders dutifully. And it's, it's much, much stronger and, and can withstand more punishment than any human creator. Um, and uh, the uh, this golem legend is best known um, through the legend of the golem of Prague, uh, in, in which there's a legend about how it's constructed as well. Uh, so here's my uh, modern sort of internet version of how you make a golem. Uh, this is almost a complete instruction set. You get a ton of clay, form it into a humanoid shape, uh, inscribe on the brow uh, in Hebrew letters, uh, in your finest calligraphy, uh, imit, uh, which means truth in Hebrew, and then you can give it commands, uh, but very carefully, because like with your computer, your computer's also a robot, you know, sometimes you give it instructions and the problem is it carries them out, right? <laughs> uh, you haven't thought very carefully about the instruction set, and it does exactly what you say, and that's the problem, right? So unlike people, when you give them orders, there's context, and the background interpretation, and communication between humans uh, uh, works because we share background knowledge that, that creates, gives words meaning. The problem with robots is they don't share our background knowledge, and so communication is much more uh, hazardous, so to speak. So the, in the legend um, of the Golem of Prague, uh, it's constructed by uh, an actual historical figure, Rabbi Judah bin uh, Betzeo. Uh, I'm probably saying that in the worst accent possible, <laughs> but um, 
who was an actual figure. This person existed. Uh, was born in 1512, died in 1609, um, and uh, was a rabbi in Prague. Uh, probably didn't make a golem, but you know, I'm willing to believe in lots of things. Maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe he actually built the thing. It was a legend. And, and, uh, but in the legend, um, it uh, so the the Jews of Prague, like like many Jews in Europe at the time, were uh, persecuted, and uh, uh, the rabbi built the golem to defend. Uh, the Jews against angry mobs and blood libel and, and such things. Um, but it ended up taking order too literally and killed innocent people. And so he was forced to decommission the golem uh, at the end of the story. And this has become, a, this is a story that's told in various forms as a caution against assuming God's power. Uh, the problem with the golem is that you, mortals can't handle the power of this. They're, they're, it's just too dangerous to create life. Now, that's the story. So that isn't the lesson I want. That is not the lesson I want you to get about statistics. <laughs> that mortals cannot have the power, <laughs> and so on. Um, what I want you to get from this is that statistical models, uh, well, they're logical, and that's where their power comes from. Uh, but that's also the danger of them: is they will carry out your instructions uh, to the letter and only exactly logically. And so you have to understand their internal functioning in order to be uh, a responsible user of them. And so in this course, we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about the construction from the bottom up of the statistical inferences and look into the guts of the golem, of, this, of the model, so that you can understand its behavior. So, because eventually, you will make a statistical model which will misbehave. Uh, but it only misbehaves according to your expectations. It's behaving exactly according to its design. And so understanding that is, is what I want to teach you to do. Uh, so think of the rabbi. So here's my here's my final joke slide on, on this metaphor, which I hope is evocative for you. It sticks with you. Uh, golems is my comparison between golems and statistical models. Golems are made of clay. Models are made of silicon. At least for now, they're in computers. <laughs> they're made of silicon. Um, uh, the golem in legend is animated by truth. Uh, models are animated in a sense by truth because we're trying to discover some philosophical concept of truth. We won't have that discussion now. What that means? Give me some beers, and I'll talk about it with you. Uh, Golems are powerful. That's the reason in legend that they're created. And it's the same reason we construct models uh, or robots, is because they can do things that are very difficult for us. It's this, this is the thing about computers and robots and models is that we design them to be good at the things people are bad at. And they're fantastically bad at the things people find easy. Right? Computers can play Go, right? But they can't recognize birds in photos. Uh, it, this is the thing. So there's this complementarity. Uh, between them. So models are, are hopefully pa very powerful. They, uh, they can do things that are very difficult for people and make it seem easy. Uh, but they're blind to our intentions, so we have to be very careful in how we design them. Um, so it's a con uh, both of these are uh, golems and models are very easy to misuse as a consequence. Uh, the golems finally are fictional. I think they're just a legend. Uh, and um, models uh, say they're not even false. Uh, <laughs> that is, they're intellectual constructs which are meant to process information. It, it, it's a category error to talk about whether they're true or false. Does that make sense? Again, give me some beers and I'll, I'll give you an impromptu lecture on that sometime. <laughs> the philosophy of science. But it's not, not necessary right now. I want to keep moving. So, um, so returning to tests in this, in this terrible flowchart. Uh, again, every uh, statistical procedure in a flowchart of this kind has its place, and, and I don't mean to malign them in general. What I mean to malign is the idea that a mature way to do um, cutting edge scientific research is to choose among these little isolated procedures and reject null hypotheses. And I think that is a very bad idea. Uh, uh, part of the reason is um, these tools were developed for fairly simple factorial designs and things under experimental control. Uh, it's a fact that many of us um, start with a a model of the system already. We, a factorial design model is just irrelevant because we have some dynamical system representation. So in ecology, this is, you know, you don't study population dynamics of lynx and hare with a factorial design. It doesn't make any sense. There's an underlying ballistic model of the population density that you want to fit to data. Uh, but if you don't do science like that, that's fine. There's, your science is still awesome. Uh, there are lots of other things about your uh, situation which may be special. Uh, so cognitive science has all kinds of issues like this with time series. You, if you have multiple samples from the same individuals in a session, then the classic factorial designs don't apply, and you're, you're wasting information. 
So, and I know most of you know this, right? Because now random effects are a common thing, and you're probably here to learn about random effects, and you will. Oh yes, <laughs> there will be random effects all over the place. Um, uh, uh, but choosing from these flowcharts is not going to get you to some reasonable inference about it. Uh, what you want is some framework so that you can go from a model of the system to evidence and ask how different models predict things. Uh, so let me spend a little bit of time now on this issue of, of the null model. And I want to convince you that the, the biggest problem with these procedures is the, not necessarily the underlying models in each, but that how they're used as procedures for rejecting null hypotheses. And that's um, maybe, I would say, the only good thing I could say about that tradition is that it's useful at the very beginning of a field when we know almost nothing about what's going on. Then discovering that something is going on maybe makes some sense. But we can nearly always do better. Uh, and it's not hard to. So I want to convince you that falsifying uh, null models is not sufficient uh, to learn how the world works. Uh, I wanna, I'm going to use an example uh, from my area of expertise, of course, because uh, uh, I know it well. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll try to present it in a way that it, it, the, the, your understanding of it doesn't depend upon the details too much. So this is a, an, an example for population genetics. So uh, there's this classic debate uh, that started in in, uh, well, even in the late 70s uh, in population genetics about the extent to which natural selection is important for structuring um, DNA. Uh, uh, it's called the, the molecular neutrality debate. And uh, uh, summarized in some crude way as, is evolution neutral or not at the molecular level? Now, nobody thought that natural selection uh, wasn't necessary to explain the design of organisms. There's there's been a consensus about that forever in biology ever since Darwin, right? But um, there's a lot of debate about uh, the exact structure of genetic sequences and the extent to which those sequences depend upon selection or mutation instead and the relative balance of those forces. So uh, you can think about a null hypothesis evolution is neutral and, and there were vigorous debates in the 70s and 80s about this uh, uh, with camps arguing that we should, the goal here, what we should do is reject the null hypothesis as evolution is neutral to show that selection is important. And you'll recognize that, I think, as a kind of standard scientific trope. Uh, so the, the thing about using statistics to uh, interrogate data is there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between what I'm going to call hypotheses, models, and statistical, uh, process models and statistical models. So let me say a little bit about what I mean here. So a hypothesis is often some vague mass of concepts and uh, path diagrams and other things that give you some expectations about natural systems. So the blob shape on the left of this slide is meant to represent that it's a bit squishy, right? Um, and so this is something like evolution is neutral. A statement like that is consistent with a bunch of different detailed process models. Now you have to teach a machine to do it, right? So there's this, there's this uh, uh, famous saying, I think it's from Don Canute, that science is everything you can teach a computer. <laughs> and everything else is commentary, or something like that. And I don't quite believe that. So, but it's a nice kind of thing to keep in mind to think about, is that when you have to teach the computer your hypothesis, you have to answer a bunch of questions that you didn't realize were necessary. And that's useful. That's really useful. So um, one process model, and the, and the famous one in this debate in population genetics over neutral diversity, uh, is the so-called neutral equilibrium model, where there's, just, there's no selection in, the, in a population, Alleles are appearing randomly at some low rate, and this accumulates uh, uh, new mutations in the population, and you're looking at the frequencies of different specific mutations. And you characterize the population in terms of the frequency spectrum of, of different alleles. So again, those, those of you who aren't familiar with PopGen, I don't, you don't need to understand that detail to get the point that I'm driving at, I promise. Um, and then from this, uh, so that process model can generate data in many different representations, however. Uh, the thing that I just described to you, the frequency spectrum of alleles, is the way we interrogate it with a statistical model. You take some aspect of the process model, but only some aspect, and you cast that out as a statistical expectation, and that's what you look at in the data. But there are other ways to look at the model, like a time series, that would make the model look different. And right, we're gonna come to that in a bit. Does this make sense for now? Just, just linking? Okay. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, what happened in the history of this debate is, well, I should say, if I can back up for a second, if you do this, uh, evolution looks really neutral. It's very hard to reject the null hypothesis. Very, very difficult um, to do it. Uh, 
So then in uh, debate, lots of people were bothered by this. Uh, most famously, um, uh, a population genetic, uh, geneticist named John Gillespie, uh, who is uh, now retired but was at my former university, University of California, Davis. And um, uh, John uh, made a bunch of selection-like models. This was like a hobby for him. He made selection-like models that imitated neutrality. Uh, he could, and he could make them like, it was like a lunch hobby for him. He could dish off another one. And, no, I'm being a bit flippant, but uh, this was a big fight in the literature. Uh, but uh, uh, here's the basic intuition. Uh, so uh, we have some other range of hypotheses that selection matters. Uh, now you can probably see that there's a bunch of different ways selection could matter, and selection can take many different forms. And so Gillespie's whole research career before he got involved in the neutrality debate was arguing with his colleagues that selection fluctuates in natural systems. Uh, directional selection only means for a little while. That's the way he thought about the evolution of beak length or anything else, is that organisms are getting shoved around uh, from season to season and year to year and, and epoch to epoch. Um, and it's not some steady march you know, of increasing body form or anything like that. And that that had consequences at the molecular level, that genomes become this jigsaw puzzle of you know, different sweep, partial sweeps. Um, so uh, he would have mathematical models of, of um, different ways that selection could work. So the, the one that um, the proponents of the neutral theory, like uh, most famously Moto Kimura, who's a, a fantastic population geneticist, uh, was thinking of constant selection, the kind of classic, you know, everybody's first Darwin model, right? Birds with bigger beaks survive more. Right, but eventually that has to stop, right? Otherwise the world would be a beak expanding at the speed of light, right? It, it wouldn't work <laughs> after a while. So, and you can reject that, uh, but that gives you some set of predictions, uh, M3 I'm calling it here, a particular set of statistical expectations that looks quite different from M2, the neutral model. But there's another selection model that Gillespie derived where there's fluctuating selection, which makes frequency distributions that are indistinguishable from neutrality. Uh, if you only look at the data that way. And so uh, when population geneticists realized this, they were like, oh, wow, okay, let's, let's sit down for a second. <laughs> and rejecting the null model couldn't possibly tell them what was going on in the real world. And this was a growing up moment <laughs> for a field. Uh, uh, it's, it's even more interesting. There's lots of cool stuff here. Um, you can think of other ways that evolution is neutral, too. What if it's neutral, but the population size is not constant? So this is what I call neutral non-equilibrium. And then you get a, another uh, uh, representation um, of the system, which I'm calling M1. Uh, so it's, there's not even a single null model. There's, so in any reasonably interesting natural system, there's no unique null model even to inspect. And I think this is also true of experiments. And we can come, up, come to this maybe when we go into some examples of experimental data. But there are uh, trivially more than one null hypothesis to worry about in most simple factorial designs. Uh, we'll sort of bug me to come back to that when we're going through a factorial design later, in a later week, maybe. And I'll, I'll put some meat on that bone. Uh, does this make some sense to you guys? Uh, all I want to get across right now is uh, rejecting null hypotheses can't get you very far. It can get you into a subject, so that's, that's cool. Uh, but as soon as there's maybe something going on there of interest, uh, you're going to have to have multiple models and interrogate them and look for a representation of the evidence that, tell, that can tell them apart. Right, because if they make the same kinds of predictions, um, then uh, you're doing the wrong experiment. Right. So the general area of this is that philosophers of science uh, are in unison that the way scientists deploy null hypothesis significance testing is a bizarre inversion of the falsificationist philosophy of science. So, which is ironic because I think many scientists think of null hypothesis testing as, as following in the footsteps of Papa Carl as I call him, uh, Karl Popper. Uh, you don't have to call him Papa if you don't want to. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so let me go through the, this summary of, of this material for you. Um, first thing I want to convince you is null models are not unique. Uh, so even if you reject a null model, uh, you may have rejected the wrong one. Uh, there's some other null model going on. What we should do instead is have multiple explanatory models uh, that we want to try and threaten. Uh, and of course, for Karl Popper, the whole point was to reject your explanatory model, not some null model, not some straw man model that you don't think is explaining your system, but the thing you think is explaining your system. You're supposed to make risky predictions from the explanatory model and, and, and see if they're falsified or not. That was Papa Carl's 
uh, uh, program. Um, uh, now, of course, the, the caveat here uh, is that falsification, so scientists do falsify hypotheses. We do it all the time. Uh, but it doesn't happen simply through a statistical procedure. It happens through all the, well, all the drama of scientific life, right? The storm and drama of, of everything we do. <laughs> and uh, this is to say that philosophers of science say that falsification is consensual. It arises through some <clears throat> consensus debate process of interpreting the evidence. And it has to be that way because sometimes the data are wrong, right? Now, we hate it when, you know, uh, we criticize someone's hypothesis and then they tell us our data is wrong. But sometimes our data is wrong, <laughs> so we have to allow that window to be open. Um, so falsification isn't some logical procedure. It, it needs meta-theoretic debate outside of the statistical processing. Uh, besides, falsifiability for Popper, and apologies, I know a lot of you guys know this because you, you've taken courses on this stuff, um, it was about demarcation. It was about drawing a line between what's science and what isn't. It wasn't a model of how science has to work. He allowed all kinds of confirmation-like processes to be productive in, in figuring out how nature worked. But in principle, things had to be falsifiable uh, to be in the arena. It was a demarcation. It was drawing a boundary. Um, it wasn't a process. It wasn't an argument for a, a, a unique process. Um, OK, let's move on. All right, so what I want to teach you guys to do is some engineering, some golem engineering. Right, we're going to have some clay, metaphoric clay, uh, in the form of computer code. And we're going to build little cute golems, little tiny ones like that one in the picture. Mm. Uh, which is fun. By the way, this is from a fantastic graphic novel uh, called Breath of Bones, which is uh, about the golem legend kind of set uh, a little bit in the future of when it actually happened. Um, so uh, uh, what we all want as scientists is a framework for developing statistical procedures that address the problems that we are interested in. And we don't need a menu of procedures or a menu in SPSS, God forbid, <laughs> that we choose things from. Apologies to those who use SPSS. I pity you and I will free you from your shackles. Um, <laughs> I'm here to help you. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we need some framework, some way to think about, in general, the connection between uh, evidence and theories of interest, whatever those theories are. And of course, there are several options. Um, this course is going to be about Bayesian statistics, but it wouldn't have to be. I could teach this course entirely without mentioning Bayes, and much of the content would be the same, uh, because there are some isomorphisms between the different frameworks. I happen to think that the Bayesian approach is the easiest to teach, uh, and it has a unified coherence to problem solving that makes it easier to teach for that reason. But you could solve all the problems I'm going to solve for you in this course in a pure likelihoodist framework. Uh, I have nothing against that. Uh, the thing I'm against is null hypothesis, rejecting straw man null hypotheses. Uh, and you can do that in Bayes just as much as you can do that outside of Bayes. So this is not a Bayes frequentist fight at all. Um, that's not what it is. Uh, the, the fact is that often the easiest way to fit a model is with some Bayesian machinery. Uh, so it actually solves problems. It has a reputation for being fancy, right? A way to show off. Oh, he's a Bayesian. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, drinks cappuccino and does Bayesian statistics. And, uh, but uh, uh, it's not fancy. It's, as I want to convince you, and I'll start into this today, um, it's brute force simple and logical. And the Bayesian approach actually lays bare, this is what it feels to me, it lays bare all the imperfections of logical inference and makes it clear that it can't ultimately tell us what's true or not. It, a lot depends upon assumptions. And all it is is an engine for uh, processing assumptions. OK, so we're going to use Bayesian data analysis as the general framework in this course for building golems. Um, and we're aiming at multi-level modeling uh, because I think that's the tool that most scientists know that they need. This is the thing that uh, in training programs everywhere, um, students know that uh, if the thing you've got to learn is random effects, or whatever you want to call it, hierarchical models, random effects, multi-level models. I tend to call it multi-level. Um, but I also use this, so I'm going to teach you to do that, because you need to understand those models. They're incredibly useful in all sorts of contexts, whether you do experiments or you analyze observational systems. Uh, but I'm also going to use them as a way to trick you into learning even more stuff, uh, because multi-level models are a gateway drug uh, into solving all kinds of problems like measurement error issues. So measurement error is a kind of multi-level model. Um, and other things, too, like factor analysis, turn out to be a kind of multi-level model. Everything's a kind of multi-level model. And 
So I want to help you see things that way so you see the unity among these different things instead of factor analysis being an island over here and a great terrifying ocean of dragons and then you know there's a nova and then there's random effects models and they're all kind of the same kind of model. And I want to help you see that that consilience so you can design your own. You don't need you don't need my approval or anybody's approval to make a custom model. Uh, you do need some care in the engineering, make sure it doesn't wreck Prague, but uh, 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 but you should feel some freedom um, to design and code your own models. Uh, so we're going to need uh, uh, some tools as well within uh, the course to do model comparison because if we're not going to reject null hypotheses, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to try to make multiple non-null models of non-null non-null models of a system and compare them. So um, uh, the framework. Uh, that we're going to do this in is uh, information criteria, but um, there are other frameworks too. I think the important thing is that you worry about the problem of overfitting, which is what I'm going to focus on, and uh, find some way to measure your overfitting risk. Information criteria are a natural tool for doing that. They're, they're kind of a cross-validation metric, uh, uh, but we can punt on that. That's chapter six. Okay, so let me spend the rest of the time today getting into the actual meat of introducing Bayesian stats. Uh, we're going to build the foundations of what it is, this embarrassing machinery. Uh, and um, so Bayesian data analysis is old. Uh, it's hundreds of years old now. It's older than most of the statistical tools that you learned in your first statistics courses uh, that were developed in the early 20th century uh, or late night. Um, uh, yeah, uh, most of them in the early 20th century uh, by Fisher and Neyman and Pearson and people like that. Uh, Bayesian statistics goes way back. Uh, I would say the, there are lots of people who were responsible for it. Uh, you, could, you could say that probability theory was developed by French gamblers so they could win money. Uh, that's, that's actually not false. <laughs> All right, and how do we know this from their correspondence? They were really interested in dice games. And um, so, you know, what a rich French, what did rich French people with mathematical educations do in the past? They gambled, I guess. And they did other things too, but lots of probability theory was built up uh, from people arguing about dice throws and probabilities of things. And and uh, but the, if I was going to pick a single individual who compressed all this into a framework for general inference, it would be Pierre Simon Laplace. Uh, you can think of as the the father of of applied probability theory in the Bayesian sense. Uh, uh, so uh, in this framework, we think of probability as a, as a way to describe uncertainty. It's epistemic rather than ontological. Uh, randomness is a property of your knowledge, the fact that you don't know something, not of the world. Uh, so the, the philosophical conceit, your point of departure is that uh, anything that appears random to you is because you can't predict the outcomes because you don't know stuff. But the actual physics are deterministic. And it's just the level of abstraction you're looking at it, you can't tell that. So, and this is of course true, uh, there's this interesting irony when we talk about random numbers, right? So, and you may know that with computers generating random numbers, sometimes people call them pseudo-random. Uh, in the Bayesian position, everything's pseudo-random. There are no true random numbers, right? Because there's a deterministic process that produces distributions. And we just have taught computers ways to mimic those distributions. And the fact that we can teach them deterministic algorithms that produce random patterns is pretty good evidence, I think, uh, for this, that this philosophical view is at least consistent with nature, right? But you don't have to buy into that necessarily. At the level we're going to think about data, we don't get into, you know, quantum mechanics and, and stuff like that. Um, so here's maybe the most useful way to think about it. Most of you know what is called propositional logic, truth tables, things about true and false, right? So. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there are these various games you do in introductory philosophy courses with, you know, Linda's a bank teller, uh, she's also a Democrat, and stuff like that, right? So somebody knows this. And then you're asked other questions about Linda. And so there are these, what is a valid deduction? And this has been a long-running interest in philosophy. Bayesian logic in the Laplacian tradition extends propositional logic to continuous plausibilities. Whereas it's not that something's only true or false, it's, eh, it's kind of true. <laughs> and, and what that means is, I'll put some meat on that as we go through today, uh, and, and when we come back on Friday as well, we'll finish it up. Um, so that's the goal, is we want to characterize our knowledge of the system, right? What is the information in the data? How plausible does it make different explanations of the data? That's our interest in it. There are other things you can do with it. You can 
sometimes Bayesian inference is, is taught as a model of rational belief. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, no, I'm not going to use the word belief uh, again in the course. We're talking about the golem's belief, not yours, the scientist, but your machine. Your machine is developing beliefs in the form of probabilities. You're going to inspect your machine and judge it, judge it harsh, harshly. Bayesian statistics uh, can be computationally difficult. And so uh, aside from fairly uh, simple models in, in what are called conjugate families, uh, you need some other uh, way um, to do the calculations. So now this is quite easy on desktop computers. Uh, starting in the 1990s, a family of algorithms called Markov chain Monte Carlo were written for microcomputers, desktop microcomputers, and um, led to a skyrocketing rate of use in the statistics profession of Bayesian statistics. It had been dormant uh, for a long time because you needed other kinds of approximations. But now we can, uh, with sufficient care, uh, we'll focus on this later in the book, you can draw um, inferences from arbitrary Bayesian models for many data sets and on your desktop in a reasonable time. Uh, so this is what I'll teach you to do. Uh, should say, Bayesian statistics used to be controversial. So it, it was suppressed in the first half of the 20th century by Ronald Fisher and his contemporaries. Um, and uh, now, Fisher, uh, maybe some other time, again, this is one of those, buy me some beers, I'll tell you the whole story kind of things. Uh, Fisher was um, really against the use of Bayesian uh, methods, which at the time weren't called Bayesian, they were called inverse probability. I think Fisher was probably the one who was responsible for them getting the name Bayesian, right? Because Bayes has, they should be Laplacian, right? We should name it after Laplace, but whatever, names are names. Uh, but regardless, in, in his uh, 1925 Handbook for Research Workers, which was extremely influential in both biology and psychology for teaching ANOVA, factorial designs, all he says in the introduction is, Bayes' analysis must be wholly rejected. Uh, and he says, elsewhere I've argued with no citation. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can, you can figure out if you read a reader's stuff what he's leaning on. Um, let's just say that, that uh, his objections have been suitably answered in the meantime. Uh, I should say, Harold Jeffries and Bertha Swirls were also two major early contributors in the contemporaries of Fisher. Um, physicists, geophysicists, who uh, actually, uh, Jeffrey, Harold Jeffries on the right was a famous geophysicist. He's credited as the discoverer of the Earth's internal structure, the way to use seismic waves to figure out that the core of the Earth is solid, and stuff like that. And um, his spouse uh, uh, was an early, and very important quantum physicist. Uh, the, the Lady Jeffries, she is, she is uh, officially known as, but her real name is Bertha Swirls. Um, and they were early uh, proponents and carried the torch of Laplace through the dark ages of the early 20th century <laughs> while no one else in the British Isles was allowed to touch it because Fisher would fire them. Uh, sorry, I'm joking a little bit. It wasn't quite that bad, but uh, there's some truth to my jokes. Um, so let me boil down and say that, that uh, I like Bayesian statistics because, um, as I said, its its inadequacies are transparent. It lays the assumptions bare. Uh, all the other statistical frameworks are equally inadequate, but sometimes they seem more powerful because the assumptions aren't as easy to read. Um, that doesn't mean they're less useful. It just means that I think some sorts of mistakes are, are more likely. Here's what I want to boil it down to in its, its modest basis is Bayesian inference is nothing more than counting all the ways that data can happen according to your assumptions. That means the model, right? The goal, the assumptions you plugged into the goal. The assumptions with more ways to cause the data are more plausible. And that's all statistical machinery can tell you. And Bayesian difference is just that. And probability theory is a way of counting uh, ways to produce things. That's all it is. Probability theory is renormalized counts. So we're, I'm going to start by teaching you probability theory over again, just counting. We're not going to talk about probabilities. We're just going to count stuff. And then I'll transition to the probability representation and hopefully do it in a way that, that is seamless enough that it makes some sense. Uh, so uh, let me contrast this view of probability with uh, the dominant frequentist view. And this is the last time I'll probably say anything about this difference. Uh, in frequentist probability, uh, probability comes is, is ontological. It's defined by realized frequency distributions in the world on, on repeat samples. These repeat samples are, at least for Fisher, they were purely imaginary. There weren't things you could ever observe. Uh, popul statistical populations in the Fisherian view statistics are just ideational things. You can't, so 
for evolutionary biologists, this is quite obvious. It's maybe not obvious for psychologists because you can imagine an endless line of students going through your experiment, maybe. <laughs> that's, all, that's your population. Uh, but for a biologist, say you're interested in the diversification of songbirds in the Andes, as one is. Right? And it's a very interesting question, actually. And uh, you don't have replicates. Right? <laughs> There's some replicate Earths out there. Are we going to rewrite history? Are we going to regrow the Andes? What are we going to do? It doesn't make any sense at all. Fisher was well aware of that. He was not an idiot. Right? So for Fisher, it was just ideational. But sometimes it's taught as if there's an actual empirical population and we're taking samples from it. Um, but the, 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 the key thing to keep in mind is that, and, and I tell you this just so you don't make this mistake in interpreting Bayes, if you're in the frequentist framework, it's the right way to think. But if you're in the Bayesian framework, it, it'll, it'll lead you to misinterpret the model output. The probability doesn't come from repeat sampling or sampling variation. It's just epistemological. It's the number of ways that are consistent with the assumptions given the data. It's not this repeat sampling thing. Often this doesn't matter. For simple things like factorial designs, you get numerically the same answer with the Bayesian analysis and the frequentist analysis. But sometimes it really does matter because you get conceptual roadblocks. The example I use in the text is um, astronomy. So on the right-hand side of this slide is my imitation of Saturn as Galileo saw it. Galileo, with an early telescope, looked at Saturn and he saw what we now know are rings on Saturn. Um, so this is cute drawing in his notebooks with its three little circles, right? One big circle and two little circles on the side. Kind of looks like that. Uh, this is probably what he saw, and you get this just by blurring Saturn. <laughs> uh, you get this. So the question is, right? What is that? What's the real image? So this is like a crime scene investigation, right? Um, sort of a problem, image analysis problem. Sampling variation, no matter how many times you look at Saturn, you're, you're going to get the same image. Uh, so sampling variation, isn't your uncertainty doesn't arise from sampling variation. What does it arise from? It arises from the natural process by which light scatters. Uh, and so the Bayesian approach leads directly into, you can use probability to, to talk about the probabilistic scenes that could produce this image. Uh, the frequentist approach gets stutters a bit. You can solve image analysis with a frequentist approach, but there's this conceptual stuttering in the middle. Um, okay, so probability is in the golem; it's not in the world. I want you to keep that in mind. You have to retrain your thoughts a little bit about that. Uh, so maybe it'll help to think like with coin tosses. Coins are not random, right? It's our inability to predict uh, which side will land up that makes them random. We can use them as a randomization device because if you flip them fairly, right, that is you flip them, then it's, it's a chaotic system. And the initial, they're so sensitive to initial conditions that they're essentially unpredictable, and that's why we call it random. But physics is deterministic, at least at the scale of coins. <laughs> Everybody agrees about that. Disagreement at smaller levels, right? Proton level, people disagree about that. But, uh, so coins are not random. The randomness is a property of us and our knowledge, right? If you spin a coin, I guarantee you it's not random. You can predict very easily which side will come up, right? The lighter side <laughs> that will come up more often. Euro coins are great for this because some countries have much heavier, massive eagles on one side of the coin that <laughs> weigh it down. <laughs> uh, sorry, this, that joke works in Germany, right? But sorry, people who are watching from other countries you don't know what I'm talking about. That'll happen a lot. All right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, transitioning to chapter two now. Uh, past the introduction, and we're going to start building up Bayesian inference um, using counting. So let me uh, get step back into, into a metaphor here um, so we can think about what our job is and, and where probability as a concept exists. Uh, so this is um, a drawing of a, a fantastic globe, one of the first um, globes uh, uh, that was manufactured in Europe. Um, this was produced in in uh, 1492 by an Austrian, I believe he was Austrian uh, geographer, uh, Beheim. And uh, I think this globe is in a museum in Berlin now. Uh, I don't know, you can Google it and, and find out. But anyway, there are 3D scans of it online. You can go and look at it, and people have drawn it. And Columbus used this globe to plan his voyage, uh, which is an interesting bit of the history because the interesting thing about this globe is, unlike most geographers at the time, Behind thought the Earth was smaller than it actually is. Uh, many other geographers, contemporaries of Behind, knew the Earth was, knew how big it was. I mean, the ancients uh, uh, knew this. Uh, there were, there were uh, Egyptian uh, geographers who measured approximately the true size of the Earth by using shadows in wells. Uh, we can talk about that story some other time, maybe. 
but Behan was like, nah, smaller. I mean, uh, I'm being a bit flippant. I don't know why he thought this, but it's a very consequential error because this compresses. Uh, we get, you know, the whole Pacific Ocean is missing in this globe. And so what you're looking at is the combined um, uh, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. This is Asia over here. This is Japan. This thing called Tsipangu uh, is Japan. And uh, that's Europe over there. You can see Hispania, right? And Gallia, uh, right up there, the British Isles, right? And then uh, North Africa, the Canary Islands. Uh, sorry, over here. Um, yeah, it's, I love this map. You can just stare at it. It's all kinds of cool stuff on it. So Columbus plans his voyage like this, and he stocks enough food and water to get him across that distance because he's going to the East Indies, right? And he's going to get some spices. <laughs> uh, it's going to be great. Uh, this could have been a deadly error, right? Imagine it was. Imagine the Americas weren't there. There would have been a lot of ocean, and what would have happened? They all would have starved to death, right? And died of thirst uh, in the oceans. Well, maybe it would have rained enough on them, and they could have lived. But uh, it would have been a, a, a big mistake. Um, I want to use this as a hopefully memorable metaphor of something that, in Bayesian statistics, is referred to as the contrast between the small world of the model and the large world that we're actually going to make predictions in. Now, we study the large world as scientists. We're interested in explaining the actual world that we live in. And this is difficult. The thing about the world we live in is we don't know the boundaries of the processes. The categories aren't naturally nominated for us. In the small conceptual worlds we use to interrogate evidence in statistical models, we define all the categories. All the possible events are pre-nominated in the model. And you have to do that in order to use the machinery. So it's the nature of like when you make a globe, you've got to define how big it is and put all the land masses there, and then you plan your voyage. But then it turns out, well, okay, the Earth is a little bit bigger, like about twice as big uh, as this Austrian fellow thought, and, um, and there are some more continents uh, in the way. And by the way, there are people living there uh, as well. So um, yeah, no wait, I should put this, you can superimpose. It doesn't fit, right? It just doesn't fit. So you think about, in this representation, if the Earth were this small, California would be, well, well Baja California and Japan would be merged. <laughs> They'd be um, stuck together. Uh, so uh, a very well-known um, Bayesian statistician from the mid-20th century, uh, L.J. Savage, I'll call Jimmy Savage in the literature, is responsible, or at least this is the first reference I could find to this distinction, and he lays it out in a famous textbook published in, in 1954. Um, this distinction between the small world and the large world. Our work in probability theory is a small world, logical world. And in the small world, Bayesian inference is optimal. There is no other way of using the available information which could produce more correct inferences. Um, so that's all these proofs about Bayesian optimality are proofs about small world assumptions. Conditional on a set of assumptions and given some set of evidence, uh, it is optimal to process it Bayesianly. But if you're wrong about what events are possible or such, then all, all optimality groups are off, right? So this is what leaves open for what I call the heuristic view of analysis. And squirrels do very well in their environments without being Bayesians, I assert. <laughs> uh, because they're not solving the problem that scientists have to solve when they fit statistical models to data, right? Uh, they're solving a more generalizable problem of how to survive to their next meal. Uh, that's not usually our job as scientists, right? So the, the, this, in, this alternation between an interest in the large world, but the use of small world tools to interrogate it is part of our business as scientists, and it's where the rubber meets the road for statistical analysis. So we're going to worry about both of these things as we go, and, and I'll have a lot to say about how we, we do a lot of applied work in the small world in fitting models, and that's often you know, the hardest part to learn because it's so awkward. It's the thing that computers are good at and we're not, right? Myself included, right? I am human. And uh, uh, so, uh, but then we need to always think about the large world and ask if the model's results make sense or uh, what other possibilities are missing here or do we trust the data? Uh, so again, let me remind you, what is probability theory? Uh, probability theory is counting all the ways data can happen, or Bayesian inference is counting all the ways data can happen according to assumptions. Assumptions with more ways to, to cause data are more plausible. So let me build this up exactly in a counting framework. It's a, it'll be a bit of a silly example, but I, my experience is that this works. It, it builds things up for people. So some of you will know this famous short story uh, from, uh, from Borges about the Garden of uh, Forking Pass. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about this in terms of a garden of forking data. Uh, there are lots of possible data sets that could have happened. You run an experiment, you walk a transect in a forest to count birds, whatever it is you do, you watch baboons groom one another, uh, whatever it is you do. And lots of data sets could have happened. Uh, and our job is to say, given the data set that did happen, which processes could, are most plausibly could have produced that. Right? And that's our goal. And we can just count them up. So let's start with an example. We're going to have some data. There are many possible different events. But each observation eliminates some of those possibilities. So I'm going to ask you to think about, we've got a bag, say. I apologize, this is not the most exciting example. But there's a bag, and uh, uh, that'll hopefully mean that the details don't distract you. There's a bag, um, and it contains four marbles. Uh, and the only thing you know is that marbles only come in two colors. I'm going to make this easy, right? Uh, uh, white, and that's supposed to be blue. It's a bit dark on the slide. Uh, white and blue. Um, so since there are four marbles, there are five possible contents in the bag. They could, number one, all be white. Uh, or there could be one blue, two blue, three blue, or all blue. Agreement? Those are the only possibilities, conditional on our assumptions. <laughs> right. Now the data. Uh, a friend of yours reaches into the bag, draws out one marble, puts it back in. Uh, the bag is shaken, pulls out a second marble, looks at it, pulls out a third, and they are blue, white, blue. So this is sampling with replacement, three marbles from the back. And now the question is, given that data, what's the most plausible contents of the back? Classic, annoying party game, right? Yeah, at least the parties I go to. <laughs> All right. So, um, no, I literally have to do a party where a bunch of uh, drunken applied mathematicians uh, challenged one another with probability uh, games. Yep. Same times. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, try doing uh, backwards induction drunk. It's a little bit harder. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so uh, let's map this out. Uh, and I'm going to get this established. Uh, I have just enough time to get this established before the end of today's session. So, again, to remind you at the top here, the um, we, on upper right, we've got data. It's blue, white, blue. We're going to consider just the first marble to start, right? How many ways could we get a blue marble? And to do this, we've got to take a particular conjecture and start with that and start counting. Because the goal is, for a given assumption about the, the process that generates the data, how many ways could we get the data we actually observed? And then we're going to compare the different sets of assumptions this way. So let's start with the conjecture. There's one blue and three white marbles. You with me? Uh, so if uh, there are four possible events um, that could happen on the first draw, uh, bear with me, right? Four possible events, because there are four marbles in the back. Right? The fact that three of them are white is irrelevant. They're still different, right? It's, they're all look the same to you only because you're only interested in color. But that's something that comes from the way you're representing the data. But they're actually different events. So they're different ways you could get a white marble. So there's one way to get a blue marble and three ways to get a white marble. Does that make sense? Because there are three white marbles. They all look the same to you, but they're still unique snowflakes. Yeah? <laughs> Each of them is special to their parents. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's one, there's one uh, way to get the first data point. Does it make sense? Uh, now the garden branches. This is this is Borges' garden. <laughs> uh, uh, so whatever happened on the first draw, four things can happen after it. So this is the garden of forking paths and uh, forking data. So. Uh, if you drew a blue marble on the first go, you could draw a blue marble on the second go, or any of the three uh, white marbles, and so on for any of the three white marbles, uh, four things could happen. So now we've got, um, what is that, 16 possibilities, right? Uh, so uh, uh, this is an interest, we're interested in getting a white marble on the second go, right? And so how many ways could that happen? Three, right? So conditional on getting a blue on the first go, there are three ways to get it on the second go, so there are three total ways. I'll summarize this as the end, don't worry. There won't be a quiz. Uh, three ways to get uh, the data so far. And then finally, the last marble gets drawn. Uh, now we've got a really big garden, and uh, uh, we've populated it all the way out, and our job now is to count, of all of these terminal points, how many of them trace out blue, white, blue? Because that's the data in sequence. You with me? So this is what Bayesian inference does for you, but you don't have to make the garden every time. I'll teach you how to 
I mean, teach your computer to do it for you automatically. That's the wonder of probability theory is it makes these gardens for you. Uh, uh, but it, it, this is what it's doing. Uh, so I can fade out all the paths that are not consistent with the data, and they're exactly three. So you can see, you've got to get a blue on the first one, then there are three ways, so you end up, and there's only one way to get a blue on the last branch. So there's only three ways consistent with the data set. So if we assume that the bag contains one blue and three white, there's only three ways to get the data. Make sense? So now it's like, big deal. Okay, now what? Well, now this is useful because we're going to compare it to the other possible contents of the bag. Uh, so uh, we're going to make a table here. So uh, here are the, on the left-hand column, the possible contents. These are our models, you could say, our possible conjectures that generate the data. And we're, trying, we're asking what produced, um, how many ways are there to get the data we actually saw? So all we've done is filled in a three there for the second row. And we've got to fill in the other rows now. So I, I assert, or I, uh, but I hope you will intuit, that there are zero ways for the first and last conjecture to generate the data. Because there's at least one white and one blue marble. Yeah? But you could make the garden and count mm -hmm. if you <laughs> feel so inclined. Right? OK. Let's do the other ones. So this is this arc on the slide is the thing you've already seen. This is, if we assume you look in the middle part, here's our conjecture, one blue and three white, there's three ways consistent, three ways to get the data set. Let's consider another one. On the bottom uh, arc here, there are two blue and two white. Now there are eight ways. It's the same kind of garden, but it gets constructed differently because there are two blue and two white marbles. So two ways to get blue on the first go. Uh, then there are four ways to get white on the second go. And then you've got two blue again, so you end up with a total of eight different ways to, to realize the data set if the bag is half and half blue and white. And then finally, uh, what if there are three blue and one white? Uh, same way to construct the garden, three ways to get blue on the first go. Uh, one way to get white for each of those, so three ways uh, to get white on the second go. And then for each of those, three more ways to get blue, so nine ways in total. Yeah? Now you can imagine as your data set grows in length, this garden gets really big, right? Combinatorics is, is really mean. <laughs> and this will grow super fast. This is what computers are good at and we're bad at. So this is the job we give the computer, is to do this. But, but probability theory compresses this counting down into a continuous number between zero and one. And that's why it's so useful. It's, it's, but it's just nor, re-normalized counting. It's, uh, literally, it is. It's a way to think about it. So let's populate our table. Um, first conjecture, uh, no ways to produce it, I assert, because you've got zero ways to get a blue marble on the first go. Uh, you can think about this as each of the steps multiplies. And the multiplication, this is where the multiplication rule in probability theory comes from, actually. It's things that have to happen together end up being multiplications. And it's because it multiplies the ways. They're, it's branching paths in the garden. Uh, so 0 times 4 times 0 is 0. There are 0 ways to get the data set for the first conjecture. For the second conjecture, there's one way to get the blue mar a blue marble on the first go, three ways to get white marbles on the second go, and one way to get blue. That's a total of three ways. Right? And then 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, because there are two ways to get blue, two ways to get white, and two ways to get blue. Again, multiplication rule is just the branching of the path. This is where the multiplication rule in probability theory comes from. It's just this, the garden. And then... Uh, 3 times 1 times 3 gives you 9 ways, and then 4 times 0 times 4. If there's ever a 0, it's all 0. 0, zero is the trump card, right? And uh, it's still 0. So uh, these counts give you relative plausibilities, and when you return on Friday, um, I will take this and we will slide gracefully into probability theory as you normally think about it, and fit a more interesting model and do Bayesian updating with it. All right, thank you guys, and I'll see you on Friday.